Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Whoa, my face is big here. I've been sober since April the 2nd of 2003. Um, and I want to thank uh, Melanie and, and Tamara for asking me to do this. It's, it's, uh, it's an honor to get to be here with you guys today and to get to share with you and, uh, and, and do this, you know, kind of walk this path together. I'm telling you, if you don't start that timer, I'll go all day. <laughs> you, don't, you don't want to let a guy like me go without a timer. Um, <clears throat> I'm, uh, I'm at my sponsor's house, Charlie's house, and um, uh, uh, I'm on, so I'm traveling, and I forgot. I forgot my shirt, tie, and coat, but, but Charlie had something here for me, so I'm, I'm, if, you, if you can see me standing up, it's pretty comical. This coat's hanging off me like a sleeping bag. But, um, anyway, it's good to be here with you guys, and, and I got a lot of material uh, that I want to cover today. I love steps 10 and 11. I want to cover a lot of material. I'm going to start out with a little bit of my experience and probably move through this pretty fast. Um, uh, I love this way of life. I love what we do here. I love um, the adventure of spiritual growth. Um, but I want to start with just a little bit of my story. Um, I um, I come from a a loving but dysfunctional family. You know, I was never abused really. I was, I was always, I always knew I was loved, maybe neglected a little bit, but, but, uh, but we were also really dysfunctional. I picked up a lot of old ideas. And for those of you who have been doing this thing for a while, you know, that, that, uh, the kind of those imprints that family leaves on us in those, um, the, these, these things create some difficulty in, in moving through life and sobriety and in recovery. And that's kind of what, what this thing is based on now. But, but when I say my family was dysfunctional out of six of us, five of us, um, have been members of 12 step fellowships, five out of six. And, and it's cool now because, because like we can, um, talk recovery and talk spiritual growth and be transparent with each other and, and all those kind of things, kind of like we do in AA. But getting to the point where five of us are, are become members of 12-step fellowships is, is, can be pretty painful. So, um, uh, you know, we, we, did, we did move through a, a lot of dysfunction. And I, I did pretty good as a kid, and I got real uncomfortable in about the seventh grade um, when I went from elementary school to junior high. And um, uh, I, I started to feel that just constant state of anxiety, the sense that I'm not good enough, that I'm not a part of, that I don't belong, um, that people are probably, you know, making fun of me behind my back. And, and um, uh, you know, and I just kind of started that, just that, that spinning, that spinning um, and those, those negative thoughts about me and, and the people around me and the world around me. And, um, and, you know, it just, it gets really uncomfortable. And thankfully, a couple of years down the road, I discovered something that would change my life. And of course, that was alcohol. And, and, there, and alcohol did a lot, lot more for me before it started to do things to me. And, and I, um, uh, once I discovered alcohol, it, it, it completely changed everything. It, it woke me up. You know, it really woke me up. It got me out of my head. I knew that I was okay. I knew that, that, um, that um let me see if i can make uh, here we go i knew that that uh that i fit in now i knew that i was a part of i knew that that um that as a matter of fact you were fortunate to get to uh to be around me and i never had that feeling of not being good enough when i was now i didn't know all this at the time all i knew at the time is it was a lot of fun drinking was a lot of fun but what i understand today is the reason i experienced so much fun when i drank is i could let go of all that stuff that was holding me down it's hard to have fun when you have all this self-inflicted weight that you're carrying around on your shoulders from this spiritual malady and 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 alcohol relieved me of all that and then, then i was able to really relax and have have a lot of fun and uh, there was no doubt that I was going to do that a lot. 
Now, you guys that come to this meeting, right, you hear a lot of speakers. And if you're around AA for a while, you're going to hear a lot of speakers, and you're going to hear a similar story to that. I was very uncomfortable. Then I discovered alcohol, and that solved all my problems, and I felt much better. But the interesting thing is, is that's not what makes me alcoholic. There are a lot of teenagers out there that are very uncomfortable. Being a teenager is uncomfortable. And there are a lot of teenagers out there that are very uncomfortable. And then they take a drink, smoke a joint, um, take a pill, whatever it may be, and they feel better. Does that make all of them alcoholic? No. No, there's something different about me. Now, uh, my story is that I went to, a, back in 2003, I went to a, a, a 28-day treatment center. I couldn't even tell you what we did in there. I mean, I know we did some stuff, but I don't remember. But what they did do is they introduced me to you. They, they, they took me to meetings. They brought people in. And, and uh, we kind of did something they called the steps, but it was just, it just seemed silly to me. And I didn't, I didn't put much effort in it or pay much attention to it. But here's what I did pick up on. Get involved in AA get out there, go to meetings and don't just go to, they told me to go to 90 meetings in 90 days and to get deeply involved in the fellowship. And I heard that. And that's what I did. I went out, I left there and I, and I fell in love with you guys right off the bat. I found my people. Um, you know, I knew that I didn't want to hang around, you know, what at that time, what we called normal people. I mean, turns out nobody's normal anyway, but, 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 but at that time I knew that I was with, with my people and you're the you're the guy you're the you're the you guys are the people that I always wanted to hang around with whether I'm drinking or not drinking I wanted to be with my people and and and, uh, and I got very involved in the fellowship and I was going early and staying late and sharing meetings and on committees and cleaning out ashtrays and 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 going to you know going to hang out with the people from the group and doing all I mean I put my heart and soul into it right and I was staying sober but I was staying sick and I started to reach a point months down the road where I was getting sick of you guys now the truth is I was getting sick of me but it seemed like I was getting sick of you and 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 I don't know if any of you guys have ever experienced this but if you go to AA meetings for a while and have no program, AA will drive you to drink. I mean, we are a group of, of we, we're a group of people that, that I mean, I, I love you guys. I love this program, but we're a group of people that take a lot of work. You know, any non-alcoholic that's ever been in a relationship with an alcoholic will be the first one to tell you, yeah, you guys are a lot of fun, but you take a lot of work. You know, and what I found is that I was just about ready to start separating myself from AA. After all, I'd been sober for nine months or whatever it was at the time. And um, and then I was sharing a meeting one night and I was like, God, I don't want to do this anymore. I've been doing too much of this. I'm ready to back out of this a little bit. And then I met that guy. A guy showed up there and uh, and he, he talked to me after the meeting and he 12 stepped me. What, you know, months into almost a year into sobriety, that's when I got 12 step really the way that the book tells us to do it. And he explained some things to me. He told me what made me different from other people. He told me that I had an alcohol problem or an allergy to alcohol that caused me to lose control over how much I drink. Once I start, I could relate to that really easy. That made perfect sense to me. Yeah, absolutely. I do that. But then he hit me with something that I wasn't really ready for. And I argued about the, I argued with him about this. You know, it's like I believed what he was saying, but then the next day I didn't believe it anymore. And it would take more convincing and more convincing and more convincing. And I think that's why the big book spends so many pages in the beginning hitting us with step one so that we can realize something that seems counterintuitive to a lot of us. And here's what that is that I don't have a choice over whether or not I pick up the first drink when I'm stone cold sober. And you ask one after another person who has relapsed. And if you ask them about picking up that drink and over and over, they'll say, you know, one day I chose to take that first drink. And what they're trying to do is take responsibility, right? And that's great. I think that's great. I want us to take responsibility. But where we need to take responsibility is not in taking the first drink. 
It's in not working a program the days leading up to the first drink or the years leading up to the first drink. Where I have responsibility is in uh, whether or not I work this program. Once I reach that point of picking up the first drink, I don't have a choice. That's not when the relapse happened. It happened well before. And he helped me to understand that. He said, Chad, the day will come where you won't have a choice. You'll think you're choosing to pick up, but actually the choice was made long, long before you were even aware of it. Um, and, and what he helped me to realize is that I suffer from a hopeless case of alcoholism. And not only am I powerless over what happens once I start to drink, but I'm powerless over that first drink. That's the hopelessness of this thing. And, you know, it's not that I could never turn it down. It's just that I can't turn it down every time. You know, and that's the tricky part. And if you drink the way that I drink, you have to be able to turn it down every single time, right? And he helped me to see that. And I was very disturbed by the whole conversation. And I was really wishing he would go away and I could just go back to the way things were. But I knew I needed to hear what he had to say. And then finally, after drilling me with this stuff for about two hours, sitting on the front steps of this clubhouse, he said, you know what you need? I said, no, Dave, what do I need? And he said, you need a spiritual awakening as a result of the steps. And it hit me. I was like, that's the stuff we've been reading in the meeting and everybody's been talking about. And I realized that I did need to do that, you know, in that moment. Now, I fought it day after day, but in that moment, I realized it. And we got busy. We got to work. And he took me through the steps. And I did have a spiritual awakening and things changed for me. So fast forward a few years, I moved down to Austin when I had about five years sobriety. And I met some people who are really important to me. I, I met Charlie and Katie. Charlie became my sponsor. I met his wife, Katie. And we did a lot of work together. And I got involved in the primary purpose group. And we started to really study this book. And I met Mark Houston. I got to sit at the table with him for, for a year or two. Um, and, uh, you know, just be blown away by what he was saying. And I, I highly recommend him to anyone uh you know if you haven't listened to any, anything of mark mark died about 10 years ago but if you haven't listened to anything by mark houston there are recordings from him all over especially if you're really interested in steps 10 and 11 you really uh you really got to check him out um so i met some of these people and started to get into this big book and found out uh, took took some things to a much deeper level and one thing that went to a much much deeper level was the third step and that's what i kind of want to start here with I was talking to a guy I, I, when I got, another thing that, that, that I got real active in when I got to Austin that I didn't know about when I when I lived in Oklahoma was um, to actively go out and carry the message that that in order for me to stay sober and to continue to recover from alcoholism and to live a happy, fulfilling life, I had to work with a lot of people. That's the kind of alcoholic I am. I have to work with a lot of people. I've got to actively carry this message. And, and they taught me how to go out and make that happen. And it wasn't, my job was not to sit back in the meeting and wait for someone to ask me to sponsor them. My job was to go find them, go find them, go places where they are and go find these guys and, and uh, carry this message and help people. And, uh, and I really got active in doing that. And when I would get these guys to a third step and take, start taking them through the third step, the way Charlie took me through it, which was an in-depth look at pages 60 to 63, Line by line, spending a lot of time really talking about the failure of self-will. Now, when I say pages 60 to 63, if you're scratching your head going, what's on those pages? Well, that means you need to study those pages because here's the thing. What's on those pages, what's described on those pages, the failure of self-will is what blocks me from having a spiritual awakening. See, what the question that I would get from these new guys a lot is, when we would start talking about self-centeredness is they would say, well, what's this got to do with drinking? And like, I didn't have a good answer. And I talked to a guy one time and said, they keep asking me that. What do I tell them? And he said, well, it's got nothing to do with drinking. And that's when it hit me. It doesn't have anything to do with drinking. Nobody walks into AA to become less selfish, but we do suffer from a hopeless condition called alcoholism. 
And the only solution to that is a spiritual awakening. This relationship with God or the God within. Well, self-will is what's blocking me from having the spiritual awakening. So I've got to get free of that self-will. And then what automatically happens is I get free of self is I grow in God consciousness. I wake up. And as I wake up and have this spiritual awakening and enter the world of the spirit, it creates an inner transformation that gives me freedom from alcoholism. So it doesn't have anything to do with drinking. But it's really important. As a matter of fact, check this out. Back here um, in Bill's story. So at this part of Bill's story, on the bottom of page 13, he's just gone through the steps. Not the way necessarily that we go through the steps, but basically the same thing. He's gone through it the way the Oxford group does it. And and Abby has promised him, Bill, when these things are done, Bill, you're going to enter on a new relationship with your creator. You're going to have the elements of a way of living which solve all your problems. That's pretty cool. But on over on the next page, it says it's simple but not easy. These things are simple, but they're not easy. A price had to be paid. So if I want a new relationship with my creator and the elements of a way of living which solve all my problems, i got to pay a price. What is that price? Well, it says destruction of self-centeredness. If I want to develop a relationship with my creator and have the elements of this way of living, which will solve all my problems, it means that I've got to get free of this self-centeredness. Now, if that's not enough for you, on page 62, right in the middle of the page, this is my favorite line in the big book. It's my very favorite line. Right in the middle of the page, it says, above everything. That's going to be pretty important. That's like above everything. And I think if you went around to alcoholics and said, in in AA and said, above everything, what must an alcoholic do? What's the most important thing? Some of them are going to say, we've got to stay sober, you know, not drink. That's like really important. Well, some of us are a little more advanced than that. And if you were to ask us, we might say, oh, he's got to develop a relationship with God. He's got to have a spiritual awakening. That's the most important thing. But listen to what this says. It says, above everything, We alcoholics must be rid of this selfishness. Above everything, we must be rid of the selfishness. So what I understand today is that this program, these 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous are not how to stay sober. These 12 steps are not how to find God. These 12 steps are about undoing what's blocking me from my natural state of being, which is one of God consciousness. That's what I understand this today. My natural state of being as a human being is to have this flow, to experience this flow of God consciousness. But I'm blocked. And that's what the 12 steps are about, is getting unblocked. So, that's what I want to kind of talk about here um, th- th- and focus on. Now, if, if, you, if you want to stay sober and be happy in AA, you got to get a home group. you got to get involved in that group, and you got to be a member of the fellowship. That's one thing you got to do. The other thing you got to do is be of service. Sponsor people, carry the message, be, be involved in, in the service at the meeting level and maybe at other levels and, and, and those kind of things. That's another thing you got to do. And, but the third thing you got to do, that's what I want to focus on today, and that's the recovery portion of this program. And that's, those are the actions, the spiritual exercises that we take to get ourselves unblocked from this flow of God consciousness. So in steps four through nine, we do this big house cleaning that here, steps four through nine is kind of like a 10th step on my whole life up to this point. And it's a big one. And I have to break it down in chunks and take it piece by piece. You know, first I write this inventory and then I share it and then I take it to God in six and seven. Then I go clean up the past. And that's all basically the 10th step, but it has to be broken down because it's for me, it had to cover 28 years. You know, 
That's a, that's a big tip. Like imagine calling your sponsor and you can do a 10 step on the last 28 years. Okay. We're going to have to slow down a little bit, break this down and go step by step. Right. Okay. Um, so what happens as we get into this work and this steps four through nine, it's a process of becoming aware. And then we, what we become aware of that's blocking us becomes objectionable. And then as it becomes objectionable, we surrender it. And as we surrender this stuff and God removes it, then we go clean up the wreckage of the past. Now, those of us that have been doing this a while know it's not that simple. It's messier than that, right? It's really, it can be really messy, but that's the general idea. So then once we've done that, now we enter into this new way of living. And this new way of living are these steps 10, 11, and 12. And my job today is to focus on 10 and 11. Um, We call these the disciplines. We picked that up from Mark Houston. He would call these the disciplines of steps 10 and 11. And um, for the, I'm not going to speak for the rest of the world, but for the alcoholic, um, in order for me to stay close to God and to grow, I have to be disciplined. I can't just make a decision that I'm not going to be selfish anymore and I'm going to do the right thing and I'm going to practice acceptance and I'm going to be courageous and I'm going to be honest. And, you know, the things on the bookmark that people have in their big books where it says step one, surrender, step two, hope, step three, whatever. I don't even know. I can't just make it. I'm going to do okay. I'm going to do those things now and then not have to do anything for a guy like me. I slip back into self-will so quickly and so strongly that it takes um, consistent discipline action for me to, um, to, to be able to stay free of it and to grow. So, so um, I like to call these the disciplines. And the whole idea here is to stay free or to continue to grow and get free of this ego so that I can experience God. And I really like the idea that these are growth steps, not maintenance steps. You know, I don't want to maintain what I had after the first time I worked four through nine. All I did was stick a toe in the water. You know, I want to grow. I want to immerse myself more and more in God and really grow. And and my experience in this program with all the people that I've worked with and people that I've known is if I'm not growing, I'm going. You know, and I've gone through those periods. Please don't get the idea through this that I do this thing perfectly at all. I definitely don't. And I've gone through periods where I didn't want to do it. And I drift. I, I'm not talking to my sponsor about something. Or I will go some amends that I haven't been willing to make. Or I haven't, you know, been consistent with prayer and meditation or whatever. I've done all those things, you know. But, but what I can see clearly based on my experience and many others is that, look, man, if you're working on the same spiritual awakening that you had when you first got sober, you're in dangerous territory. You know, because we have to continue to grow. I hope today that I'm not giving you the same talk that I would have given five years ago on this subject, you know, because my experience in this has grown a lot. Um, Okay, so let's let's take a look at this. In the 10th step, the first thing that I notice here in the 10th step is on page 84. And and I would hope that that uh, that as we, you know, stay. So I'm a big book guy and, you know, I, I really love this big book and and the most worn pages in my book are 60 to 63 and 84 to 88, because I really like to, like to you know, carry the message of what it is that blocks us from God, and then this way of living um, that, that can help us stay free. Um, so it uses this word, um, continue, four times in this paragraph on page 84. It says, it says we continue, and what we're doing is continuing to live the principles that, that we practiced in steps four through nine. It's not an overnight matter. We, we're here to grow in understanding and effectiveness through living this way of life. And um, uh, that's, that's the goal here. And, you know, uh, it's a popular thing to say in AA that there are no experts and there are no teachers. And I'm going to throw out an opinion here. I would love to say that I can do an hour talk and not give you any of my opinion. I'm just going to be honest about that. You're going to get some of my opinion. That does not make it right, but you're going to get a little bit of it. In my opinion, that's just not true. I mean, how do you become an expert on something? You do it over and over and over and over. The more you do it, the more of an expert you become. So if, if, there's, if, if one of our members has written a thousand reviews at night, has written a thousand pieces of inventory, I'm going to call you an expert on it. 
you you really know how to do it, right? Um, and the interesting thing about teachers, we have no teachers in AA. If we had no teachers in AA, why would it be important to remain teachable? I mean, people like to say we have no teachers, but then that same person will turn around and say, it's important for me to remain teachable. If we, why would we remain teachable? You guys teach me all the time. I'm in primary purpose group. We study the book slowly and it's almost like a big book workshop. And there are people that share on a weekly basis in that meeting and they teach me about this program. And as they teach me, I become more effective at doing this stuff and I continue to grow closer to God and I become more effective at carrying this message. And I love this. I love this way of life. Now, just because someone's an expert, does that mean they're never wrong? Absolutely not. You know, absolutely not. So that means we don't have to take one person just because they say, it. read this book and, and, and take this stuff into prayer and meditation. And, 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 you know, I don't know how I got off on this soapbox, but, but I do think it's important that we grow in understanding and effectiveness by continuing to learn and practice this program and then carry this message uh, to others. So what tells us here, the first thing it tells us to do here in the 10th step is to watch. Whoa, that's a big one. And I see this as actively watch. And I'm going to give you a quick example here. I used to work in a school for teenagers that were in trouble. The high, my high school that I worked at was the school that you go to if you get kicked out of your school. So you can imagine the student body. They were a fun crew. And most of us in here can relate. I mean, it was like a cafe in the morning at breakfast. It was like a cafeteria full of newcomers that didn't want to be there. You know, that's the, that's my fellowship right there, you know, and, and there was always something going on. Kids were passing Xanax under the table to each other. They were talking about how they were going to jump this kid after school or, or there was always something going on. And my principal told me when I was on duty in the cafeteria in the morning to walk around and interact with the kids and notice, has a kid been crying all morning or is this kid upset or what are these kids talking about? Or is this kid or his pupils dilated and he's, just, you're like, oh, we better, you know, let the nurse check on this one. All those things. My job was to actively watch because it's not in that school. It's not like something might happen. It's not if it happens, it's when it happens, right? Now I work with a guy and I've written inventory on this guy, I struggle with him a little bit. He didn't do it that way. He sat at a table back there and he would have his laptop out. And he would be preparing his lessons for the day. Now, if a fight broke out, he's there. But if you ask him how so-and-so was doing, he didn't even know if they're at school today or not, right? So what I was doing was actively watching. He was waiting. And to me, that's what the 10th step is asking me to do, to actively watch this thing. Watch this thing. Because I don't know about you guys, but my thoughts go dark. I love this. I was, in, I was at one time I was interested in some stuff on the law of attraction and it kept telling me to think positively. And I was like, I'm really struggling with this. And I, I'm watching my thoughts throughout the day. I'm like, wow, I don't ever think positively. This is not cool. What I realized, it's not that I'm miserable all the time. Sometimes I'm really happy. But those are the times when I'm not doing much thinking. But when I'm doing a lot of thinking, I'm not thinking good thoughts. So, so what I got to do is I got to learn to watch this thing. And actually watching is a really cool thing because if I'm watching my thoughts, I'm not my thoughts. See, I lived at a level of consciousness most of my life where I am my thoughts. If I'm thinking it, it's real. That's where I live. That's what I am. But what the book is asking me to do is back up a little bit to a higher level of consciousness and just watch those thoughts. And not just my thoughts. Watch how I'm feeling. Watch how I'm showing up. You know, watch what's going on here, inside here and outside here. Uh, and that automatically taps me into this higher level of consciousness. Okay, what am I watching for? It gives me four things. I like to say watch for when you're disturbed. You'll learn to recognize the difference in these four things. But my gosh, if all you can catch is that I'm disturbed, that's doing pretty good. Watch for selfishness, dishonesty, resentment, and fear. That's a common theme throughout the big book. And we'll see that again in the 11th step. Then it tells me, gives me four things to do. Ask God at once to remove it. So go to God first. Discuss it with someone immediately. Listen to these time references. This happens fast. By the way, the 10th step is not the review. My first time through the steps, my sponsor taught me the 10th step is what you do at night. 
and the 11 step is what you do in the morning. That's not what the big book says. The big book says the 10th step is what happens throughout the day. The 11th step is what I do at night and what I do in the morning. Okay, so I do this quickly. I'm disturbed. Something's come up. Maybe I'm mad at somebody. Maybe I've had a little conflict with somebody. Maybe I just had a bunch of fear hit because I got some bad news or whatever. First thing I do is go to God. Second thing I do is call somebody up and discuss it as soon as I can. Third thing, if I've caused some damage, now I need to go clean it up. And hopefully we talked about it. Now I can go clean it up. And then the fourth thing is to turn my thoughts resolutely, turn my thoughts to someone I can help. Okay, so that's quick action that I take in that moment. The quicker, the better. The quicker I can do this, the quicker I can get free. If it sets in, it's much harder to get free of. That's when we're talking about revisiting the fourth step, you know, and, and going back and going one of those sprees. I love on page on page 73 in the book. Here's what happens if I don't do this work. Um, this, the inconsistency is made worse by the things he does on his sprees. Coming to his senses, he's revolted at certain episodes he vaguely remembers. Ever go through one of those things where you just forget about the 10th step and you go on a spree of self-pity, anger, fear, whatever it may be, and then you're revolted at episodes you vaguely remember? These memories are a nightmare. He trembles to think someone might have observed it. As fast as he can, he pushes those far inside of himself. He hopes they will never see the light of day. He's under constant fear and tension. It says here that makes for more drinking. But in sobriety, that makes for more thinking. And we just get in that cycle, you know, one of those sprees. Anyway, so the idea is to practice this 10 step quickly. Now, I want to talk about the principles laid out here. That principle of watch. Katie talks about this. Um, uh, and I love it. And 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 KDP, that's a great 10 step talk. There are a lot of them out there, but I highly recommend hers if you haven't heard it. She talks about practicing the 10 step from a place of being asleep versus from a place of being awake. From being asleep, that's when we're walking around, going to AA meetings, walking around in life and, and just doing the 10 step as it says it on the wall, not, not doing it as it says it in the book. And if I step on your toes, it offends you, you let me know about it and wake me up. And then I go talk to my sponsor and apologize to you for what I did. Okay, that's one level of the 10th step. But I think we can go deeper. If we really use this word watch, I can stay awake and I can see what I'm thinking maybe before I offend you. Maybe before I act out, I can start to catch this stuff earlier in this uh, watching from a higher level of consciousness. Okay, another one here, ask. We ask God at once. Ask is a principle we can practice. Ask is a surrender. When I have a problem, I want to fix it. I want to solve it. Well, first I want to blame somebody for it, and then I want to fix it, right? And fixing it is how I cause damage in a lot of cases. But this is asking me to first go to God. And ask is about surrender. It's not my go-to. My go-to is to solve this problem and fix life back to the way I think it should be. Do you guys realize that, that this universe has been going on, according to science today, almost 14 billion years? I've been here 47 years. And I think I know how things should be. I mean, when you put it that way, you know, so maybe it's not my job to fix it. Maybe my job is to go to God to get undisturbed about the way life is. Okay, um, another principle here. I like this one a lot, turn. The last thing we do in this, in this spot check inventory, the fourth thing we do here is we turn our thoughts to someone we can help. This is a common principle practiced on, in many different religions and philosophies. And here's the idea. If I'm holding something in my hand and I don't want it there anymore, I just drop it. Now my hand's in. If I've got a thought in my head and I don't want it there anymore, I can't stop thinking about it. I can't just make it go away and have an empty mind. My mind will not be empty. Brief moments in meditation, I can reach empty, but it's brief. It's very brief. If you're trying to learn to meditate, silently like an eastern style meditation you say i can't do it because my mind won't stay empty join the club neither will ours you know we just try anyway so 
there's a there's a law of substitution. I, I, Emmett Fox talks about this. Others do, too. But this law of substitution, I think the way he describes it is like this. If I tell you, don't think about the Statue of Liberty. You're thinking about it, aren't you? I See? Yeah. Um, but if I go into a very detailed description of the history of the Eiffel Tower and how it was built and the engineering behind it and, and, and you know, and how how it looks out over the skyline and all these things. Well, then you forget about the Statue of Liberty for a moment, right? So the idea is that we can't empty our minds of thoughts we don't want, but we can turn. We can substitute another thought. Christianity would have you turn your thoughts to God. Buddhism would have you turn your attention to your breath. Great practices. AA says, turn our thoughts to someone we can help to get out of ourselves. Whatever it is, I want to get out of where I am because we have a superpower. Here's what that superpower is. If I want to, I, I, can, I can shoot energy into something. Here's how I do it. I pay attention to it. So if I have a problem and I want to energize that problem, then all I got to do is think about it a lot. Really focus my attention on it. And the problem will grow. So I don't want to, to, to focus all my attention on how to solve this problem. Now, don't get me wrong. This doesn't mean that we don't do anything about a problem. But my job first is to correct the inside before I go correct the outside. And that's what we're trying to get to here. Okay. Um, so as we do this, as we do this, practice this 10th um, step, what happens is, is we, the book says, it gives a, the book gives a really great set of promises. And I'm not going to get into those because I want to get through this and move on to the 11th step. But, but these promises really speak back to what we um, talked about in step one, how we're insane around the first dream. And in these 10 step promises, it tells me that sanity has returned around that first dream. And this can apply to other things too. When, when I take these things into this work, sanity will, can, can return. And the cool thing is, is I don't have to focus all my effort and attention on the specific problem. Like we don't focus our effort on not drinking. We focus our effort on writing inventory, making amends, prayer and meditation, things like that. And then the problem is removed. And that's the common theme here is that we don't focus our attention on solving the problem. We focus our attention on getting free of what's going on in here. And then we're amazed so often about how the problem is removed or the obsession is taken away. And it says this, that's how we react so long as we keep in fit spiritual condition. And again, it's a, this is a program of discipline. If, if you want to be physically fit, okay, so I, I'm into that. I like to feel good. I want to be physically fit. I try to eat right. I try to get enough sleep. I try to drink plenty of water. I try to get some sunshine on me. I try to get my bare feet on the earth. I do these things. Some of the things I do are kind of weird, but I do these things to try to stay physically fit and feel good. You know, um, uh, the, the, you know the goal is to be healthy right up until the day I die. Now, I know that, you know, that may or may not happen, but I want to give myself the best chance I can physically fit. Okay, the book talks about fit spiritual condition. I want to be spiritually fit. Well, to be spiritually fit, I also have to do things. I have to pray. I have to meditate. I have to write inventory. I have to do, make the, I can't leave amends unmade. I, ha I can't keep secrets. I've got to be honest and transparent with somebody. I have to do these things if I want to stay spiritually fit. You know, um, there was something I wanted to. Oh, back here on page 62, it says, it says, um, above everything, we must be rid of this selfishness. We must or it kills us. God makes that possible. For a long time, I thought that meant God does it for us. It doesn't say God does it for us. It says God makes that possible. Well, how do you make it possible? He inspired Bill Wilson with a set of 12 steps that the alcoholic can take that makes it possible for us to get free of self. But we have to take those steps. We have to do this work. Um, this is a practice. There, there are many different ways to, to, to practice spiritual growth. I love this one because it uses life. I use life to grow spiritually. Life will bring me issues that trigger things that are deep down within me, that are stuck there, 
there's stuck energy in me that's based on things that might have happened in my past or or I don't even know how that, but there's stuff in me that's stuck. Here's how I know that. Someone says, hey, Chad, how are you doing? And and instead of saying, oh, I'm doing great. Thanks for asking. They say, how, how are you doing? And I'm like, what do you mean, how am I doing? How are you doing? Why would I have that reaction? Now, today, that reaction ha- happens up here much more than it happens out here. I, I, I've, I've learned enough to know, okay, don't react that way. Hold that in, and we'll address it later. For the moment, say, I'm doing great, man. Thanks for asking. But why would I even have that thought? Because there's some stuff stuck down in here, that, and you triggered it by what you said. Is that your fault? No, huh? no, not at all. If you want to start bringing some of this stuff up and you're in early sobriety, just go get in a relationship. The other person will bring it all up. That's, that's the beautiful thing about a relationship. I, I never tell sponsees, you know, don't, don't, don't date anyone for the first year or whatever. But, but I think that really the, the reason that that came about in AA is because some sponsor said, I don't want to deal with this. So here's the rule in AA. Don't date for the first year or something like that. I don't know. Um, but, but anyway, what happens is life triggers this stuff. So now's my chance. I'm disturbed. It's come, it's like if you, if you, you, you know, to clean the fish tank, you stir it up and all the stuff rises to the surface. That's the same thing here. If when I'm disturbed, my stuff rises to the surface. Now I got, I got choices here. I can repress it. That's, that's, that's what I do, man. It's, we were joking about it the other day. We we're talking about um, uh, how men, I was, I was with my girlfriend and we were with uh, one of her friends and, and, and then her friend's husband. And, and he's kind of like me. And uh, somebody said a feel something about a feeling coming up. And I said, oh, here's what you do when those feelings come up. You just stuff them back down in there, deep down in there. And he said, yeah, don't worry. They'll come up um, as sarcastic remarks. It's like, that's how I live right there. You know? But OK, so this stuff comes up. We can repress it or we can express it. Sometimes when I can't shove it back down, then I express it. I blame it on you. I blow up or I, I act out in fear or whatever. Or third option a new option that we have, we can practice the 10th step. And that's how we get free of it is through this practice. And that, so in that sense, I'm using life, whatever's coming at me as a vehicle for spiritual growth. This is how I grow. Now I'm not looking for problems because when you have as much stuff down in you as I do, that's blocking you. Life will present plenty of problems on its own. So that's what I use and that's how I try to grow. Okay, so now the 11th step. Um, in the, the, it says here that, that, that we're going to get a set of precise instructions. And I really think that in early AA, they were big on this. They had a, in early AA from what I, which is limited, but what I know about the history Um, they were really big on working with wet drums. If you were a member of AA, you were making 12-step calls all the time when this book was written, if you were a member of AA. They were also really big on the 11th step, inspired by the Oxford group, really, really looking at this stuff and talking to people about it and going to God and having a strong connection and listening to God and, and, and all this kind of thing. So they gave us some, some, I love it, where they say it would be easy to be vague about this matter yet we believe we can make some definite and valuable suggestions. So they're going to tell us here exactly what to do. So they start with the review. So this review has a set of questions that we can ask so that we can do some reflection on the day. Now, remember, above everything, we must be free of this self, selfishness. That's the goal. So now we're going to take some questions here and look at how self shows up, how it manifests. So we look at, we answer some of these questions. I'm a big believer in putting this stuff on paper. There's a magic that happens pen to paper. If you're one of the youngsters out there and and you're doing it on a keyboard, it doesn't work as well for me, but if it's working great for you, I'm not going to be the one to, but whatever it is, it's to me, it's much better to get this stuff down on paper than it is to just think about it. Just my, just my opinion based on my experience. So I write this stuff down. Um, and go through these questions, answer all these questions. And if you'll notice, a lot of these are related to the 10th step. Where was I resentful, selfish, dishonest, afraid? Those are the same things we're looking for in the 10th step. 
is there something I should have discussed with somebody that I didn't? Same thing we do in the 10th step. Do I owe an apology? Same thing in the 10th step. Was I kind and loving toward all? Back in the 10th step, it says love, uh, love and tolerance is our code. So I'm really, it's almost like I'm doing a check on the 10th step. And I almost always find that I did not practice the 10th step perfectly today. So I'm glad that I have this review so I can look back over it and see what I missed. And it's not about finding fault. It's not about looking at where I'm, something's wrong with me. It's about becoming very aware of what blocks me from the sunlight of the spirit. That's all. And that's why I don't look at my assets. I don't look at the good things because those are fine. I want to keep them. I'm trying to become aware of, and I try to do this as a scientist looking at an experiment. No opinion, no emotion. Let's just take a look at it. Hmm, That's interesting. Wow, look how you did that. You know, look how you were a total jerk to that guy just because he asked you how you were doing. That's interesting. Let's take a look at that. I'm not blaming myself for having that. I know that stuff deep down within me that causes me to be driven, that I'm powerless over on my own power, that I'm going to have to work a program on for this stuff to come up. So, okay, so then it goes on um, uh, to uh, ask, and to me, this is a big, the first thing to me that people do wrong on the review, and I don't know about where you're from, but where I'm from, the first thing people do wrong is they don't do it. I don't know how many people I know that do a practice every morning of reading and prayer and, and meditation, but don't do the review. And, and to me, if you don't, if you can't do it at night, a lot of the men that I know are too, they're, they're too tired. They turn on the TV and then they're like, oh, I got, I can't stay awake to do the review. We'll do it in the morning. Then. Do it before you do prayer and meditation, whatever. As long as we're doing it every 24 hours, let's do the review. Second thing that I see that people do wrong with it is they don't focus on these corrective measures. Um, I'm going to do a quick screen share here on on, uh, an example of one of these that I did. This is one that I typed up that I did years ago. I typed it up so I could share it with a guy. And and, uh, this is one that I did that kind of covers everything on the review. I just kind of looked over the day, um, uh, what I did that day. And then the first thing was I resentful. And I went ahead and wrote a real quick piece of inventory with column two, then column three, then column four on this student that was in my class that day. Um, If you're interested in seeing this, um, send me an email. I'll put my email address in the chat here at some point. Send me an email and I'll just send it to you. Um, Then was I selfish? And then I wrote down here some self-pity that I was in around something at work and how I complained about it to coworkers and how I procrastinated. And of course, procrastinating leads me to not doing as good of a job because I, uh, you know, put it off to the end and then I rush through it. Okay. Where was I afraid? Um, I was dishonest on this thing that I did and I was afraid I'd look bad. Uh, do I owe an apology? Yeah. Maybe for complaining. Um, I didn't discuss any of this with, I didn't do a 10th step on any of this. Um, I talked to anybody about it throughout the day. Um, Kind and loving. What could I have done better? I could have done a 10 step. I could have used this, this project as an opportunity to pray and demonstrate the power of God. I could have paused and asked for a new perspective when I got agitated at the student. Um, I was thinking of myself when I was in self pity. Um, what was I thinking of what I could do for others? Yeah. I, so that night I went, I chaired primary purpose group and met with a new sponsee after the meeting. So yeah, in that moment, I was thinking about how to help this guy in the moments leading up to it. Uh, pack into the stream of life. I was focused on serving others and having fun at primary purpose group. It's so much fun over there. And then let me move this so I can read here. Okay. And then, uh, then we get to these corrective measures and this is where I get quiet. I close my eyes. I take a few breaths and I ask God for corrective measures. And then I write down whatever comes to mind. Now, this is a practice that the Oxford group was doing called two-way prayer. And, um, I'll try to remember to put this in the chat too. If you're interested in that, there's a website called twowayprayer.org, I think is the website. Um, And Father Bill does a great talk on the history of the Oxford group and how they did two-way prayer in early AA, but it's listening to God. It's it's asking questions and listening to God and and writing it down. So that's what I did here. Um, 
so so here's what comes to me after I ask God for corrective measures. You have a great opportunity with this student. It ain't him. He just brings up qualities you don't like about you. Turns out this kid's just like me. I didn't even think about that until I read this. You guys are not together by accident. Take advantage of the time you have with him to help him be accountable and help you let go of false beliefs you hold about yourself. Then express gratitude for him, for he's a great teacher. Okay, so the corrective measures to me are a huge part of this review. Now, as I've done, this one was from years ago, and it's just one that I happen to have typed up, so that's the one that I use. But I want to read you some corrective measures I got a few months ago that um, blew my mind. So um, let's see. Um, I took a picture of this, and uh, and here's what it says. Now, I got quiet. I asked God for corrective measures, and this is what came into my mind. And I want to say before I read this that this one blew my mind. They're not always this long. They're not always this detailed. But sometimes they're like this. Here's what it says. Chad, you feel stuck because you are stuck. The answer is to live a life of service from a place of surrender. Make that your intention. Learn to live from a place of surrender. If you can do that, it doesn't matter where you are, who you're with, or what you're doing. Let your external life follow your internal condition. Where do you fall short of this ideal? Courage. You fall short on having the courage to get uncomfortable. You think you can manage your life to be somebody. You believe if you can be this person, you'll be safe and protected. Let go of safe and protected. That's not your job. Your job is surrender. My job is to keep you safe and protected. Then you can act from a place of surrender. I know that you really don't understand how to do this right now. Just make the commitment and affirm an open mind and open heart. Trust the process and listen. There's a voice in there. You will learn to hear it more clearly and distinguish it from your busy mind. And then my prayer that followed that was, God, help me see clearly how to live from a place to surrender. Open my eyes. I'm afraid, but I'm willing. So that was a big one when I was having a big struggle. Now, that is magical. And that comes from years of doing this review and asking for and listening for and writing down corrective measures. And I can't believe that, that, that some of these guys that I talk to that have been doing this for years don't do these corrective measures and they're missing out on that. So, and, and if you, and, and you can also do this for guidance on all kinds of things. So again, check out twowayprayer.org if you're interested in that, on how to listen to God or how to listen to that inner voice. I call it my authentic self. You know, a Christian may call it like the Holy Spirit, or I call it inner vision, or, you know, things like that. Um, uh, Whatever it is, it's that connection to the divine that I'm trying to listen to uh, in meditation. Okay, on awakening, this is where I set an intent. Um, I'm not going to get too much into the details of this, but this is about, so I, now I, I know what the day before it looked like. I know where I fell short. I know, I know my patterns. I know where my struggles are. I know what, and, and, and remember, I'm just trying to be free of what's blocking me so I can live in the sunlight of the spirit. So I'm going to set an intent for the day. I've got plans. I'm going to ask God to, to help me plan my day. And then there, now there are, I may face indecision. I don't know what to do about this. I got something coming. I don't know how to handle it. So let's get counterintuitive again. Relax, take it easy. Ask God for inspiration and intuitive thought. You know, the answers will come. And later in the book, it says, if our own house is in order, how's my own house going to be in order if I'm not doing the review? If I hadn't written inventory since my first four step? You know, how am I going to be inspired? How am I really going to be have conscious contact with God if I'm all a mess and I'm asleep to it? Okay, so in doing this, it gives me some warnings. Look, man, this is going to be ugly. This is going to be messy as you're learning to do it. And I just, I just love it when people say, oh, I'm just not very good at that. None of us are very good at it, man. You just got to learn to do it, you know? I don't know if there's any golfers out there. First time you hit a golf ball, it does not go where it's supposed to go. It takes practice. Same thing here. You know, learning to develop conscious contact with God takes practice, and we get better at it. We have to work at it. 
and uh, have a good attitude. It says, it says um, um, uh, it works if we have the proper attitude and work at it. There you go. Then we conclude this period of meditation we've gone through here. I know I kind of rushed it. We conclude with a prayer. And now we're praying for the strength and direction that we need to deal with what we know is coming up today because we've looked at our day. And we know what's coming. I know I have a problem with this person. I know today I pick up the kid from the ex-wife. I know that's going to be it. So I got to get prayed up. I got to ask God for direction and strength because I don't want to show up the way I've been showing up. I want to show up a new way, right? Okay, so um, it goes on down here to talk about, to me, the 11th step as it's laid out in the big book opens the door to spiritual growth. Now, go find some teachers, whether Emmett Fox was a big one in early AA, but so was the book of James was required reading in early AA. I lean more toward the Eastern side of things. I've been reading The Untethered Soul. I love Michael Singer. I've been studying that. He's got a new book. I'm really a big fan going that direction. I've done all kinds of things. I've done Buddhist meditation classes. I've done Bible studies. I've chanted Hare Krishna at Kirtans. I mean, I've done done Native American uh, ceremonies and sweat lodges. I've done all kinds of things, and I love it. It's awesome. And when I first got to AA, I thought all that stuff was nonsense. You can keep your prayer and meditation and all that stupid Santa Claus stuff. I thought it was ridiculous. And today I just, I just love it. It's so much fun. Um, okay. There's another action it talks about here. As we go through out today, we pause when agitated or doubtful and ask for the right thought or action. Again, that's counterintuitive. I get agitated or doubtful and I want to fix something and saying, don't do that. Pause, ask God, go to God. And then it tells me constantly, constantly remind ourselves we're no longer running the show. Hmm. Well, back on page 85, it says, how can I serve God? These are thoughts which must go with me constantly. Back on page 20, it says, our very lives as ex-problem drinkers depends upon our constant thought of others and how we may help meet their needs. So here's what we need to be thinking constantly. Tell me if you're thinking this constantly. I'm no longer running the show. How can I do God's will? And how can I help others? Whoa, that's a tall order. That's the goal. That's what I want to do. Okay, so um, this is it. This is steps 10 and 11. As much as I could fit into 50 minutes, um, there's one way to do this wrong, and that's by not doing it. That's the one way to do this wrong is by not doing it. So, so what I suggest to anyone that's interested in this is start listening to talks on 10 and 11, listen to workshops read books, study this thing, talk about it with people and learn how to do this. And the reason that we do this, number one reason is not so I feel better, but so that I can more effectively practice the 12th step. Do I feel better in the process? you damn right I do. Do I stay sober? Yes. But the main purpose here is to fit myself to be of service. And here's the answer to alcoholism. I always like to end my talk with the answer to alcoholism. Here it is. Be of service from a state of surrender. If you can do that, you can be free of alcoholism. Thanks for having me, guys. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.